Hello everyone and welcome to another day of learning with Breakfast by the Bay. My name is Letty. Behind the camera today we have Captain Chris and we are going to be talking to you about some weird and magnificent creatures known as plankton. But before I dive into this topic, if you're viewing right now, just give me a thumbs up so we know you're there. And also, if you're viewing from a particular school, if you're representing a particular school and tuning into this video, let us know in the comments so that we can give you a shout out either later in this video or later, later on social media. Uh, so, um, today, like I said, our topic is going to be plankton. Some really weird creatures that live not just in Narragansett Bay, but throughout the entire world. Now, as you can see right up here, I've drew, drawn two pictures. One, you might recognize from SpongeBob SquarePants. This is how people typically are familiar with plankton. Whenever I teach plankton to kids at schools, they always say, like plankton from SpongeBob. And while plankton is actually based off a real life plankton, one of the most common plankton in the entire world, the copepod, uh, plankton is not exactly a great representation of what plankton really are. And maybe by the end of this video, you might understand that a little bit more. And it's not just that these plankton aren't trying to steal the Krabby Patty recipe. Uh, so, I think we have a couple people tuning yeah. in right now. So we're actually going to move on to the next board where I'm going to start telling you all about plankton, what they are, and try and differentiate them from this plankton right here. Uh, so if you're just tuning in right now, my name is Letty. We have Chris behind the camera. If you have any questions during this segment, please shoot them our way. Chris will read them to me and I promise I'll do my best to answer and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so, plankton, what are they? Well, if we take the word plankton, it actually literally translates to wanderer or drifter. So wanderer just means something that just going around, kind of doesn't know where it's going. Um, and this comes from the Greek word planktos. So that's just the literal translation. And it's actually pretty accurate uh, because the real definition of plankton, the scientific definition is a free floating plant or animal that cannot swim against the current free floating plant or animal that cannot swim against the current. You might notice that I've underlined free floating and cannot swim against the current because those are the two things that make plankton. If they are not free floating and if they can swim against the current, then we'll get them out of there. That's not what they mean. So let's kind of break that down for a second because I know free floating kind of isn't totally clear. Free floating means that it's something that's not attached to anything. There's a lot of creatures in the sea that attach themselves onto rocks or maybe another animal, and that means that they're not floating around in the water. They're attached to something, so not free floating. And then cannot swim against the current. So if you don't know what a current is, a current is just the direction that the water is moving. On a day, especially like today where it's really windy, you can see that the water actually moves in a certain direction. So, if an animal cannot swim against the current, that means that they're going wherever the current is taking them. Now this is really important for our definition of plankton as well. So, I have a couple animals listed over here, and I want to see if anyone can take this definition and apply it to these animals and decide if they are plankton or not. So we have dolphin, tuna, crab, sea star, and jellyfish. If you have any thoughts, just shout them out, but I'm gonna go through them right now and kind of tell you yes or no. So, dolphin. Well, first off, is a dolphin free-floating? It is. It's in the water, it's not attached to anything swimming around. Can a dolphin swim against the current? They can. They're strong enough and they can swim against the current, so that means they are not plankton. Just because they're free-floating doesn't mean they're plankton because they can swim against the current. Same applies for tuna. They're also free floating, but they are really big and strong animals, so they can swim against the current. If the water's going this way, they can go that way. Very easy. Next, we have a crab. So a crab, is it free floating? 
No, it's not. Most crabs live at the bottom of the water. So they're kind of walking around the bottom of the bay, trying to find food there. So they are not free floating. So we can immediately be like, no, crabs are not plankton. It's pretty easy. Uh, what about a sea star? We've met sea stars at our breakfast by the bay before, and there was something really specific we talked about. And those are their tube feet that they have. Those are their suction cups on the bottom of their legs that help them hold onto rocks. So if they're holding onto rocks most of their lives, they're not free floating. And also they can't really swim either. So they're definitely not plankton. And then finally, we have a jellyfish. So jellyfish, hmm. Is a jellyfish free floating? Yeah, jellyfish is in the water. It's just floating around, so that's right. And can a jellyfish swim against the current? The answer for that one is no. A jellyfish cannot swim against the current. So does that mean jellyfish are plankton? They are. And the really wild part about that is that there are some jellyfish, like the lion mane jellyfish, can get up to 120 feet long. To put that in perspective, that's the size of three school buses put together. Bigger than a blue whale. That's crazy. So that jellyfish, no matter how big it is, does not have the ability to swim against the current. So I like to bring jellyfish into this discussion because a lot of people, when they think of plankton, they only think of microscopic organisms or organisms that you need a microscope to see. And while most plankton are microscopic, we can't just say all of them are because something like a lion's mane jellyfish, 120 feet long, is still considered a plankton. It's free floating and goes wherever the current takes it. Awesome. Matthew correctly guessed that a jellyfish is plankton. Matthew, Sounds good. How are you? And that the dolphin or tuna were not. Um, and Lexi had a question. Lexi. How about um, plants? Are there plants that are plankton or are all plants plankton? Lexi, that's a really great question. And you know what? That's perfect for the next board that I'm going to show you. So if you can hold off on that answer for just a second, I promise you that's going to be all cleared up. Uh, the one last thing I want to add to this definition of free floating plants and animals that cannot swim against the current is that just because an animal cannot swim against the current, does not mean that it cannot move. So we know jellyfish can move, we've seen them before, we kind of see them pulse in the water. So just because they move, they're not necessarily strong enough to move against the well, to swim against the current. So these are all really great questions and I'd like to give a shout out to Matthew for coming up with all those great answers. Really good job. All right, so I have another board back here. A little bit more overwhelming than the last board, but I promise once I start breaking it down, it's gonna make a lot more sense. So uh, as to answer Lexi's question, which was an amazing question, um, we do have two types of plankton, plants and animals. Now, full disclosure, there are more types of plankton. We have virus plankton and bacteria plankton. But I'm not going to get into those today. We're just talking about plants and animals. So um, let's start with the plants. If we are talking about plankton that are plants, we call them phytoplankton. Now phytoplankton are named so because the word phyto actually means light. Now this will become clear in just a second when I talk about how they produce oxygen. So thinking about plants on land, we know that they're important for a lot of reasons, not just for humans, but for the entire world and ecosystem. And one of the reasons that they're important is because they give us oxygen, they produce oxygen. They take all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and they bring it in and give us oxygen to breathe. We wouldn't be alive without them. But the thing you have to remember is that while we do have plants on land, 70% of the earth is covered by water. So if 70% of the earth is covered by water, that means that there are a ton of plants in that water. And so that means that 50% of the oxygen that we are breathing on land comes from plankton. So a lot of people think that the rainforests are doing all of the work and producing all of the oxygen, but really it's the plankton that are doing most of the work. Now we should clarify that a lot of this is algae, so it's microscopic algae that we can't really see with the naked eye. 
But if you ever take a look in the water, especially somewhere like Narragansett Bay, a lot of people look at it and see that it's kind of brown, kind of green. And I've heard people say before that they think that's a type of pollution. They think the water's dirty. But what you're really looking at are millions and millions of phytoplankton or plant plankton coming together and making that greenish brown color in the water. So I'd like everyone to take one deep breath and then take another. That second breath comes to you straight from plankton. So make sure you think plankton today because that's why we're all breathing and alive. Uh, so there's another reason why plankton are incredibly important. And it's the same thing that goes for plants on land. They are at the bottom of the food web. That means that they're able to get energy from the sun. If I was to go stand outside, kind of like stand like this for a while, I wouldn't get any energy from that. I might just get a sunburn because I'm so pale from winter right now. But out, um, plants, if they're outside and they're spreading their leaves, they're taking it in that sunlight and making energy. And that's where we get all of our energy from. So I've drawn a very basic food web for everyone here. Right, um, right here, we have phytoplankton. As I just mentioned, phytoplankton are plants. Plants get their energy from the sun. So they take that energy from the sun. And then zooplankton, which we'll talk about just in a second, and those are animal plankton, they like to eat those phytoplankton. Then something like a filter feeder or something that eats uh, microscopic organisms in the water, like clams, are going to come and eat that zooplankton and phytoplankton. They're just going to take it out and that's how they get their energy. Fish will go ahead and eat those clams. And then something like a seal will go ahead and eat those fish, right? But then, you know, if we want to throw a wrench into this entire food chain that I just drew, something like a humpback whale would come in, filter feed, just like the clams, and eat the phytoplankton and zooplankton. So my question to you is, what would happen if I just went ahead and erased phytoplankton from the equation? Uh oh. What would happen next in my food web? I think I know. That would mean that all of these zooplankton would have nothing left to eat. Remember, most of these are microscopic creatures too. So they need those t microscopic plants to survive and eat. Then those clams wouldn't have anything to eat either. They have no phytoplankton or zooplankton. Those fish would be gone. And then finally, our seals and our whales. So if we take phytoplankton out of the equation, all of those animals, or the entire food web, would collapse. So these phytoplankton are incredibly important. None of these animals are going to learn to stand outside and absorb sunlight in order to get their energy. They need those phytoplankton to do that hard part for them. And something else you want to remember is that there are more phytoplankton in the ocean if we take all of them and put them on one side of a scale and then take all of the whales, the dolphins, the sharks, the fish, and put them on the other side of the scale, the phytoplankton would be way heavier. This is including blue whales, it's including great white sharks. If we took all of the plankton, it's heavier than all those animals. So we're talking about huge amounts of plants, huge amounts of life in the water that is sustaining the rest of the life. It's pretty crazy. I hope I explained that well. Uh, so the final reason why plankton are so important is they make fossil fuels. So if you've been watching your video, our videos, Breakfast by the Bay videos, you might have already learned what fossil fuels are. Uh, but fossil fuels are pretty much just the gas and the oil that we are putting into our cars, right? It makes everything work. The electricity in this room, cars that we drive. So when people think of fossils, and I know I'm guilty of this too, I tend to think of dinosaurs. But most of the fossils that we are finding and using for this energy come from plankton that died millions of years ago. 
And I think Chris is trying to tell me that I have a question. No, I was just making sure that we weren't going to lose the light again because I know it likes to turn off if we don't move a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Chris, for being proactive. Uh, so these plankton died millions of years ago. They sunk to the bottom of the ocean. They died. And inside their bodies, they had carbon reserves. They had all this carbon built up in their bodies, right? And then we discovered that we could use this for energy. So without these plankton that have been around for millions and millions of years, we wouldn't be able to do most of the things that we do today. So they're very important. Three reasons, they produce oxygen, they're the bottom of the food web, and they've given us fossil fuels. Pretty crazy. All right, so those are plant plankton. I know it's a lot of information, but we're now gonna move over to our zooplankton. So it's very easy to remember the difference between plant plankton and animal plankton, because if you take the word zooplankton or zooplankton, if you wanna say it that way, you can just remember that you see animals at the zoo. So we're talking about animal plankton when we say zooplankton. Uh, now, when we're breaking these down, we're talking about two different types of plankton. And this is important because there are some plankton that stay plankton their entire lives. And then there's some that start off their life as plankton and then metamorphosize into something else. Now, if we're talking <laughs> about animals that, uh, there we go. There we go. If we're talking about animals that um, start off their life as plankton, we're talking about larval stages of some marine animals. If you don't know what a larval stage is, that's pretty much just baby animals. And then they grow strong and they become better swimmers. Maybe they attach themselves to something or maybe they live at the bottom of the bay. Now, I'm gonna hold off on telling you some examples of these right now because I actually have some for you. But I wanna see if anyone who's watching this video can guess what animals might start their life off as plankton and then eventually grow into strong swimmers, attach themselves to something, or maybe move to living at the bottom of the bay. So just give those guesses to Chris and we'll see if anyone gets the right answer. But while you're thinking, I wanna tell you about holoplankton. So holoplankton are creatures that stay plankton their entire lives. So that means that they're born plankton and they die plankton. Now we've already learned one example of this, and that is a jellyfish. Something like the lion's mane jellyfish starts off really small, but even when it gets to 120 feet, they um, still cannot swim against the current. Uh, but jellyfish are probably the best known example of a holoplankton because you can see them with your eyes, you know? But the real rock star of the plankton, um, of the holoplankton group is the copepod. The copepod is in the water in huge numbers. There's so many copepods out there. As I mentioned before, plankton from SpongeBob is based off of copepods. So when we're looking at our plankton sample later today, maybe we'll be, even be able to spot some copepods in the water because they are so common, so abundant that we see them all the time. Awesome. Great. So um, now that you've had a second to think about some marrow plankton, we're actually going to show you some animals that start off their life as plankton, but then eventually move on to a different stage in their life. Chris, did we have any guesses? Uh, Matthew's guessing that crabs start off their life as a plankton. Awesome. That's his first guess. Lexi sounds super excited about crabs as well. She says crabs for life. Crabs for life. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, um, really great guesses, guys. You'll know in just a second if you're right or not. Uh, the first animal that I'm gonna show you, or the first two animals that I'm gonna show you that start off their life as plankton are these two. Now, I know we have some diehard Breakfast by the Bay fans watching right now, so I know you've met these animals before. This here is our sea urchin, or our purple sea urchin. These start off their life as plankton, but then, as they grow bigger, they eventually find rocks and attach themselves to those rocks with their tube feet, all right? And then the same goes for our friend, the sea star, right over here. You actually get a pretty good image of those tube feet right now. 
So those two feet develop as they get older, as they grow bigger, and they can attach themselves to rocks. But right here, I have a couple pictures of what these animals look like when they are first born. So these are the larval stages of these animals. So when they're first born, these are just floating around in the water. They're released um, from eggs, they float around, and as they grow bigger and bigger, they get to that life stage that we're seeing right here where they're no longer plankton. Great, perfect. Next, we have this animal right here. Now, I don't know if we've seen a live one of these just yet, but this here is a whelk. These are very common in Narragansett Bay, and when you are looking for plankton samples, you a lot of the times find plankton or larval stages of snails. So it would look something like this. Now the one thing I really want to note about this plankton is you kind of see these like wings coming off of it. See that? So those help the plankton float in the water because if this plankton sinks to the bottom too soon, it's not going to survive. So they want to make sure that they are floating in the water. And that's what these wings help it do. Now I wanted to show you this right here. So that is a whelk egg casing. What would happen is a whelk would lay that egg and then out of those eggs would come little animals. Now these are little baby whelks right here, but these are bigger than you might find them in planktonic form. So you can see how small they start off. These animals um, have thousands and thousands of babies at one time because a majority of them are gonna end up being eaten by other animals. So they just release thousands and thousands of these animals, expecting that a lot of them will be eaten by those filter feeders that want those zooplankton. Uh, and then eventually some will survive and make it to this adult stage. Next, we have another animal that also starts off its life as plankton. You've probably seen these on the coastline before. These are our little periwinkles, and it's the same thing as the whelk. They lay their eggs, they're born super tiny, and then still have those kind of wing shapes on them. Next, this one goes out to Lexi, crabs for life, we have our hermit crab. So hermit crabs definitely start their life off as plankton, and when they're first born, they don't have this shell. Because if we know anything about hermit crabs, it's that when they're born, they don't have a shell, and then they find snail shells throughout their life in order to protect their body. But then also on this shell, we have these. Does anyone know what those are? You might see them on rocky shores a lot of the time, kind of what you end up cutting your foot on more often than not. Those are called barnacles. So barnacles have their life stage also beginning as plankton. They release thousands of eggs, they're floating around in the water, but then eventually barnacles attach themselves to a hard surface. So there's no way for them to reproduce without starting their life in that planktonic form. They have to float around and then they find a new place to live. They colonize different places. So that's really cool. And then finally, we have this guy, our fan favorite. This is our spider crab. Spider crabs, you might know, can get really big. I've seen spider crabs in the bay that are, I don't know, two feet across. They can get really gigantic. This guy's a little bit of a smaller one, but they also um, release eggs. Normally a female uh, spider crab would hold eggs right here in her apron. This is a male spider crab, but they would hold it in their apron, their bright orange eggs, they release them into the water, and then you would see the plankton form, or the larval form, looking something like this. And most crab plankton look pretty similar, so if we see any crab plankton in our sample today, there's a pretty good chance I won't be able to specifically identify it, but we'll know at least that it's a crab. So, knowing all of this, knowing all of this, I wanna ask you a question. Does anyone here watching this video have an idea of where plankton might live in the water? If I was gonna try and find plankton, where is the most likely spot that I would find it? It's very interesting. So there's actually two different answers. There's an answer for 
phytoplankton, and there's an answer for zooplankton. Phytoplankton live their life at the very top of the water. You can just zoom in on that, Chris. So they're gonna live their life at the very top of the water. And the reason for that is because that is where the sunlight is going to be the strongest. As the sun gets into the bottom of the bay, it gets weaker and weaker. So a phytoplankton wouldn't be able to absorb that sunlight that it needs for energy to grow. Then, like I said, we also have zooplankton. Now zooplankton, there's two answers for this. They spend part of their life in the middle to the bottom of the bay. Now this would be during the daytime, because just like we can get a sunburn from UV rays, zooplankton can also be harmed by that sun. Also, during the day, that's when fish are hunting for food. That's when all these animals are out trying to get all those nutrients that, we, that they need. So, zooplankton, go ahead, hide down here during the daylight hours, but then they make something that's called the Great vertical migration. We've heard the word migration before. It means an animal traveling a long distance for some life need. So instead of going this way or this way, zooplankton are gonna go up. And if you think about how big a zooplankton is, it's about, well, it's smaller than a diameter of hair. So. If it needs to travel from 20 feet deep to one foot depth, that's the equivalent of miles and miles and miles. So this great vertical migration brings them to the top at night, and that's when they feed on all of this delicious phytoplankton that keeps them alive. Oof, great. Awesome. Yeah, so great vertical migration. We know that plankton are fascinating and amazing creatures. Now I actually want to show you some uh, plankton that we actually caught for you. Um, when we were looking, when we were trying to catch plankton, we can't just scoop a cup into the water and look at it like that. Yes, there are going to be plankton in there. There's going to be a lot of plankton in there, but it won't be densely concentrated enough to actually see the plankton like we want to. So we have some special equipment called a plankton net. Now, if Captain Chris could actually do me a favor and show them our trawl net right yeah. up there, that is a net that you might have seen before that's used to catch animals in the water. But if you look really closely at it, you can see that it has big old holes in it, right? Lots of holes. Lots of holes right in that net. So if I was going to pull that net through the water trying to catch plankton, no way. Those plankton would easily go through those holes and escape. So we have a net that looks very similar to that one. Uh, with a few key differences. One, it's going to be smaller. Two, if we look at the netting of this plankton net, it looks like there's no holes at all on it. And that's because the only thing we want to go through this net is water. These plankton are so tiny that we can't give them the space to escape. So we have the uh, mouth of the plankton net we have the belly of the plankton net, and we have the cod end of the plankton net, and that's where we're gonna catch our sample. I would drag this net on top of the water for about 10 minutes, and just, you know, back and forth, nothing special. The water would go in here, escape through the sides, and then all the plankton would end up right here in this cod end. So I did that for you yesterday, and actually this is a very exciting time to be catching plankton because it's springtime means a lot of animals are coming out and they're breeding and we know now that a lot of plankton that we see are marrow plankton or baby animals so I was able to actually go and catch some of those samples and we're going to show that to you right now we have some pretty special equipment that we use to show this right now uh, we have this microscope with some slides set up so that you can see the plankton through the microscope. Then we attach this to our iPad, and then it just pops right onto the TV over here so that you guys can see the plankton really well. So let's turn it on and see what we have. Oh, let's see here. Let's go ahead. 
Might have dried up a little bit. I think it dried up a little bit in the process, but have no <laughs> fear. We have a lot of plankton. All right, so. Oh, uh, yeah. At this point, if you want to go ahead Ooh. and draw some of these animals or some of these plankton that we're seeing, go for it. Uh, but what you can also do is later, go ahead and take a piece of paper, draw what you're seeing, and then attached to this video is a plankton guide of all the plankton that we would commonly find in Narragansett Bay. Um, what I like to do is look at these plankton, kind of draw what I'm seeing, and then give it a name that I can easily remember. So if I see a plankton that looks like a donut, I'm probably gonna name it a donut plankton. And then you have that image in your head, and when you see it later, you can identify it even better. You can be like, I've seen this plankton before. So what we're looking at right here, I don't know, we have uh, some definite zooplankton in here. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, those look like some of those. Those are um, larval worms, some marine worms. So just like on land, in the ocean and in the bay, there are worms that live down in the mud and sand and sediment. So when they're babies, they spend their life as zooplankton up at the surface. Yeah, definitely. So that's very cool. I mean, you got a really good view of this one. And so the cool thing about teaching plankton is that's actually different all times of year. So as I mentioned, a lot of animals are coming out right now and they're starting to breed, but not all of them are. If I was going to do this in two months, you'd have a whole different group of animals that were planning on breeding. And so if I was going to go out and get a plankton sample, you'd be able to find totally different animals, whether it be spring, summer, fall. Sometimes the winter you can yield some stuff, but that's when a lot of stuff decides to rest. Oh yeah, look at those. Very nice, ooh, cool. All right, so as we're just looking at these, I wanna kind of give people opportunities to take a peek at them and observe these. What do you notice about them? Are you wondering anything about them? Do they remind you of anything? It's a very good question to ask when you're looking at plankton. Um, but I wanna tell you a couple cool things about them. So plankton, um, as we're looking at them, you know, they're really tiny organisms, right? And not everyone has a microscope in order, or, yeah, a microscope in order to see these creatures. You can see jellyfish with the naked eye, but that's not something that you're going to see all the time. Um, so if you're also looking for a kind of cool thing that you can do to spot plankton, you can look for something called bioluminescence. Now, bioluminescence literally translates to living light. And you might have seen this before in something like fireflies, how they glow at night. Now there's some plankton that do the same exact thing. You just have to refocus, I think, a little Miss Letty, because it's focused on the stuff that was closer and the little phytoplankton, I think, are further away in the opposite direction right now. It's okay, no problem. Let me try. If you want to hold the phone, I can also prep a slide while you're talking and see some more. Sure, totally. Thank you. Stuff. So, let's yeah. talk about bioluminescence for a second. Bioluminescence. Oh yeah, that's looking tough right now. Uh, so, uh, bioluminescence. I'm actually gonna have watch Chris do this right now because it's kind of a cool process. So, bioluminescence are um, living light. These are animals that are able to create light from their own bodies. So maybe you've ever been to the beach before. Um, you normally see this in a little bit warmer water and you've seen glowing in the waves or maybe you've stepped on some part of the wave and saw that there was a glowing. This is from bioluminescent plankton. That means that they can actually create light in order to distract predators. Now there's places in the world there we go. There's places in the world that you can go, and it actually looks like a starry night on the beach. Um, oh, and no. I've actually seen... <laughs> <laughs> I just flipped the camera on myself. There we go. I was trying to focus. That's much better. So we can see bioluminescence on the beach, and I've actually seen it at Matunic Beach in South Kingstown before in, like, September time when the water's really warm. You can go uh, to the beach at night, maybe throw some rocks in the water, and you can see the water glowing, which is really cool. So if you're ever interested in kind of exploring plankton more, you don't necessarily need a microscope. You can actually do it on your own time, either looking for jellyfish or going to the beach at nighttime to see those really cool light shows. So right here, 
I don't think that's one we've seen before. Have no, you, that's a little baby barnacle. That's a little baby barnacle. Remember how before I was talking about how a barnacle attaches itself to rocks. So this barnacle right here is, um, you know, not attached to anything. This is that life part, uh, that life stage where it's floating around trying to find something to attach to eventually. Um, and as I mentioned before, remember, just because a plankton cannot swim against the current doesn't mean that they cannot move. So this guy, pretty active right now. It's very cool. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the lights right now. We've had a lot of plankton talk <laughs> during this day. Uh, so um, one thing I just wanted to let you know is that we actually have a couple fun plankton activities for you. One of them being this fun plankton craft. So all you really need is a coffee filter. Everything else that we have attached to this plankton is totally up to you. We have ribbon, we have pipe cleaners, we have a feather. And if you want to, you can go home, take a coffee filter and decorate it however you want. You can make your own plankton and you can do something called a plankton race. So that means you would take this plankton and drop it to the ground. Now, the entire point of a uh, plankton's life and survival is based off floating at the surface or being able to get to the surface. So that means they have to be able to float. So if you're doing a plankton race, you want to make your plankton, drop it, and then whoever's plankton reaches the ground last wins. Because if your plankton hits the ground, that means that it didn't float long enough in order to survive. So that's a pretty fun craft that you can do at home. Maybe you have some siblings there and you want to beat them at a plankton race, so that will be pretty fun. Yeah, those are great. I used to, we can drop those down the stairs if you have some stairs inside that go down to a floor. Yep. Or even um, if there's like a little window, you can drop them out, you can do it outside. Just make sure if there's any big heights that you, your parents are with you while you're doing it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, next also, if you wanted to do another kind of plankton craft, if you actually wanted to catch some plankton on your own, later today we're going to be posting a video of how to make your own plankton net. And this is all household materials that you would have lying around. Water, there's microscopic creatures in all bodies of water, to try and find plankton with that plankton net. Uh, now this is a life, uh, this is a age old tradition. Darwin even used a plankton net when he was on the HMS Beagle um, in 1832, I think. He used a plankton net, caught stuff then, so if they can do it in 1832, you could do it now. Just watch our video later so you can accomplish that. that. Uh, finally, the last thing attached to this video is a video of bioluminescence. That's that kind of like lit up beach that I was talking about. If you want a better idea of what that looks like, just check that out. Uh, but otherwise, I really appreciate you tuning in learning about plankton with me and if you have any more questions just drop them in the comments and we'll do our best to try and answer them for you so thanks for tuning in and we will see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock for another breakfast by the bay